In 2003, I lived in the southwestern part of Virginia, in the US, in a small mountain town. The town had been a coal mining town for generations and had been around since the 1800s. After living in the basement of my girlfriend's mother's house for over a year, we decided it was time to get our own place. The place we had chose to rent happened to be the second home we looked at. It was a two-story brick home that had been around for well over a hundred years. It was conveniently located across the street from a bank, restaurant, and grocery store. The current owners had remodeled the home to have an apartment on the ground floor and another on the upper floor. The apartment we chose was the ground floor apartment. And although it was $50 more a month, we didn't mind. We signed a one year lease and moved in. As we settled into our new home, things couldn't have been better. No one lived in there in the other apartment, and it was incredibly peaceful considering its location. For the first month, things were normal aside from the small little creaks and noises that were associated with the noises of an old home. One night, things changed as fast as the flip of a coin. Sitting in our living room and watching TV, we began to hear defined footsteps walking around in the upstairs apartment. At first, I thought that someone must be moving in upstairs, and we both got excited to see who our new neighbors were. We decided we should go sit on our shared front porch and wait for an opportunity to introduce ourselves. After an hour or two, we gave up and went inside and bedded down for the night. For the next week, we continued to hear someone walking around, but never saw our new neighbors. At this time, I worked a job that had me working various different shifts. One particular night, I got home and my girlfriend asked if I could maybe talk to our neighbor about all the noise we were hearing. I obliged and went to knock on the door. After knocking a few times, no one answered and I gave up. I stepped out front for a cigarette and had a realization that I never saw a moving truck and no new vehicle was parked out front. And perhaps even more strange, the lights in the apartment never appeared on at night. At the end of the second month, as I dropped off my rent to the landlord, I asked about our new neighbors and was told the apartment hadn't been rented yet. I told our landlord about the noises. He said that wild animals must have gotten in somehow and he would stop by and look at the situation. He came by on a Saturday and we looked around the empty upstairs apartment and couldn't find a sign of anything. He told me it must be the noise of an old house and I just had to accept that. I knew there had to be more going on, but I saw for myself that nothing could be making those noises. Life continued and so did the footsteps. A few weeks later, we had some friends over for dinner when the footsteps started again. My best friend started to remark about how loud our neighbors were, and I filled him in on what was going on. He was convinced that someone must be breaking into that apartment at night. With a little bit of liquid courage, we found a creative way to get the door open and went in to inspect. Once again, the apartment was empty, and I was at a loss. We locked up the vacant apartment, and that is when the conversation came up about the house possibly being haunted. And this was something that we would just have to accept. This conversation went on for a few hours between myself and girlfriend and our two best friends. In retrospect, I wish this conversation and exploration never happened, as the following day everything got worse. Our friends got up the next day and headed home. We decided to walk across the street to the grocery store and spent the next hour shopping. Upon returning home, we unlocked the door and walked into our apartment to discover every door and cabinet in the house standing wide open. This sent chills up my spine. From this point forward, we had a routine of checking everything before we left home. Every time we came home, everything was wrong. We experienced doors being opened that were closed and lights or fans would turn on or off on their own. This wasn't an electrical issue as the switches themselves would be flipped. The more that this happened, the more concerned we became. But we were under a lease, and although the events were strange, it didn't seem malicious. So, we stayed. 
As days went on, it escalated. One evening I was sitting in our spare bedroom, which is where our computer is located. My girlfriend comes walking in and asks what I need. Me being confused by this, I ask what she means, and she says she heard me call her name. I told her that I had not called for her, and she accused me of trying to prank or scare her. The following night, I'm back in the spare bedroom, and I hear her call my name. I got up and went to see what she needed. She hadn't called me and again accused me of trying to scare her. At this point, I'm starting to get really concerned as disembodied voices can't be a good thing. This continued for a long time as we lived there, and it got to the point that my girlfriend would say my name and I would ignore her, as I thought it wouldn't be her at first. For most, this probably would have been enough, but yet we stayed. After about four months of living there, we received a knock at the door. I answered and was greeted by a nice lady that was around the same age as myself and my girlfriend. She stated that she had lived there before the remodeling and how much nicer the apartment looks. We agreed that it was nice, but asked her if she ever experienced anything odd while living there. She quite frankly said, Oh, you mean the ghosts? Yes. We were talking about ghosts. She stated that the house was definitely haunted, and she used to contact the ghosts on a Ouija board when she lived there. Then she asks if we would be willing to move into the upstairs apartment and let her have our apartment, as she wanted to move back to the home but couldn't handle the stairs due to her being pregnant. I politely declined as my girlfriend was partially disabled after a car accident and we chose this apartment specifically due to that. I could tell the girl was disappointed in hearing this, but she was cordial and gave us her number in case we changed our minds or if we decided to move, so that we could let her know. For the next month, things continued. They didn't escalate, but didn't get better either. At this time, the girl who appeared in our door a month ago was back, and she informed us that she was moving into the upstairs apartment and appealed to us again to switch apartment. We politely declined. She proceeded to move in. For the next month, things seemed to be getting better. Neither of us heard the voices, the issues with the doors and lights stopped, and any footsteps upstairs could now be justified. Just as we got used to normal life in the house, the activity started again. But now it was worse than ever. Now we had to deal with all the issues from before, and now new things were happening too. At times, you would feel breathing on the back of your neck, only for no one to be behind you. We started seeing shadows move out of the corner of our eyes, and began to have issues with light bulbs burning out prematurely, and batteries and devices draining at an unexplainable rate. At this point, we had less than six months left on our lease and decided that we were moving when our lease ended. The experience we had in this apartment had put a massive strain on our relationship. At this point in time, my girlfriend was doing everything in her power to not stay in the house alone while I was working. On multiple occasions, she went to her mum's house and stayed there for days at a time. Every time she stayed at her mum's, she asked me to stay with her instead of staying in the house alone but that would have added an hour to my commute each day. I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared, but I did it anyway. One morning I woke up after a long and mostly sleepless night. As I lay in bed trying to wake up, I hear footsteps in my apartment, and I know that I'm home alone. As I quietly get out of bed, I see my girlfriend walk past the bedroom door. This surprised me, as I didn't expect her to be there. I get up, and walk in to find out what she is doing home, and realize that she isn't there. I frantically call her and explain that I just saw her in the apartment. She tries to calm me down, but explains that it wasn't her, as she was still at her mum's house over half hour away. Now I am scared, and feeling alone. I decided this was too much, and appealed to my girlfriend to please come and stay with me. I wouldn't have the strength to do it alone. She declined and said that the ghosts and or demons don't care about numbers. And to deal with my stress, I turned to smoking weed so that I could relax. But it didn't relax me at all. If anything, it only elevated my anxiety. It did, however, help me sleep. So I made it a routine before going to bed. 
One night, the guy who I used to buy my green off stopped by to drop some off. I gave him my address and told him to knock when he got out there. Instead of getting a knock on the door, I get a phone call from him. He says that he's out front and that I shouldn't be sitting at home alone and I should come hang out with him for a while. I agree and head out the door to meet him, get in his car and as we pull away, he tells me to move out of that place now. I of course asked him why and he said that if he told me everything he knew about that place, I would never step foot in there again. I pushed for more, but he wouldn't tell me. I am now truly terrified, but also curious as to what happened in the house. At this point, I had two months left on the lease. I'm spending every night online looking for info about the house. And one night, a guy I work with came by to help me search. I was amazed how much he helped me discover in such a short period of time. We found the age of the house, a picture of the home that was so old, the main street in front of my house wasn't a road, but instead a railroad track. We also found a news article talking about a fire in the house and the death of the occupant during the fire. Once we found this article and started to read it, we both began to hear the voices of what sounded like 10 kids playing on my front porch. I jumped up to look to see what was going on. And the moment I opened the front door, the noise stopped. And obviously, there was no one there. My friend from work was so freaked out by this he left immediately, and refused to ever step foot in the house again. At this point I am now volunteering for overtime, just so that I don't have to be home. One day I came home to find a moving truck sitting out front, and my upstairs neighbour was moving out, as the stairs were adding complications to her pregnancy. She informed me her mother would be by the following day to pick up the last few items that were left. This night was strange due to how peaceful everything suddenly became. No noise, no voices, nothing. That had to be the best night's sleep I had had in ages. The following day comes and I'm outside mowing the lawn when the mother of the other tenant arrives. I'm greeted by her and we talk briefly about her daughter and the soon to be baby. After a few moments, we parted ways and she went inside to gather the rest of her daughter's belongings. I offered to help but she declined. So I decided to stick close by just in case. After two trips to her car, she looked at me and stated that she only had a few pillows left to load up and how she couldn't wait to walk out of that creepy house for the final time. We had conversations previously about the haunting, you see. About two minutes after she went inside, I heard a scream and the sound of something tumbling down the steps. I went to investigate. The mother had apparently fallen down the steps. As I went to help her, she asked me to get her away from the house and said something forcefully pushed her down the steps. I helped her to the car, and she asked if I could grab the pillows that she dropped as she fell. She stated that if I didn't feel comfortable, that they could just stay behind. Attempting to be Mr. Macho Man, I told her I'd get them for her and proceeded back in. I reached the top of the stairs, grabbed the pillows and ran back down, and I slammed the door closed and returned to the mother. She was visibly shaken and had a bruise appearing and I asked if she wanted to go to the hospital but she declined and asked if I would drive her and her car home. She said that she would have her husband bring me back. I knew she was in no shape to drive so agreed and after a short 10 minute journey I dropped her off and her husband returned me to the house. Now I really am alone in the house and I know it can hurt people. That night before I went to bed, I stepped out on the front porch for a cigarette. As I go back inside, I notice the door to the upstairs apartment is standing wide open. One half of me wanted me to just pull the door closed while the other half of me thought I needed to make sure no one was up there. I knew that I had closed the door earlier and I feel like if it had been open, that I would have noticed during one of my many times outside that evening. Ultimately, I decided to go upstairs and check everything out. As soon as I arrive to the top of the stairs, I hear an unnatural voice say, Leave. I ran down the stairs as fast as humanly possible, locked the door to the upstairs apartment and returned to my apartment more scared than I have ever been. After tossing and turning for several hours, I finally managed to fall asleep. When I awoke the next day, my front door was standing wide open. I had two locks, one on the doorknob and a deadbolt that could only be operated from the inside of the apartment. Both locks were in the locked position, yet the door was standing wide open. 
I'm losing my mind at this point. Having around five weeks left on the lease, I don't feel safe here at all. I know I'm not spending an entire day in the house alone, so I decided to shower and get ready to leave for the day. When I turned the water on, nothing happened though. I called the landlord, as water was included in the rent. I went to the back porch to call him while I smoked and realized that the stairwell going into the basement is filled with water. I call the landlord and he states he's out of town and that he keeps a key to the basement hidden in each of the apartments in case of emergency. I get the key, shut off the water to the house and while doing so realized that a plastic or PVC pipe had broken. I knew I could fix it so I offered to do so. The hour that I spent in that basement was horrible. Nothing happened while down there, but I was totally creeped out. I got a very strange feeling that I was being watched, or that something was going to jump out and attack me. I finished the job, and finally got my shower. I decided to go to my girlfriend's mum's house for the night as I was far too stressed. The following day after I got off work, I went back to the apartment with a realization that I only have a month left in that place. I had dinner that night, sat down and watched TV, and in the middle of my show, my TV went black. Then it flashed white. Then it all went black. All for the letters D, I, E. This lasted for about five seconds and the TV powered off on its own and then would not switch back on. The following day, I dropped the TV off at a repair shop on my way back to work. The TV was just a little over a year old and after I got off, I swung by the repair shop and was informed they couldn't find anything technically wrong with it, but that it wouldn't power on. This was the final straw. The following day, I went to the bank and applied for a small home loan that was approved. I only entered that apartment one more time, the day I moved out. The experiences I had there have stuck with me. And although I have lived in many different places in my life, no place sticks in my mind like that one does. I feel lucky that I was never physically hurt, but the mental toll of something like this can stick with you forever. I worked for a power company, restoring power after storms. I was working when a lady came up complaining that her power went out. We explained to her, that's why we're there, and she should have her power back soon. She said, oh good, my son went into the basement and now I can't find him. I went with her with a flashlight down the road to a run-down house that was partially caved in. She walked inside and I went to follow. As soon as I walked into the door, she disappeared from sight. I called for her multiple times, but no one responded. So I ran back to our work truck to call for help. A man that was living on her street called to me asking what was wrong and I told him the situation. He looked at me with a cold stare and said, a mum and her son died in that house four years ago. I'm still shaken to my core this very day. I'm going to share with you something that I've carried with me for the last 24 years and I haven't really spoken much about since I was a child and I've never spoken about it on any kind of public forum such as this. You are free to not believe me I, in fact, encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anyone. I am sharing this with you because, as I've gotten older, I've spent two decades developing a life to the best of my ability. I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that neither therapists nor psychiatrists treat as anything other than a method of repressing memories at best and the delusions of a lunatic at worst. I do not blame you if you draw these same conclusions. I'm sharing this with what I believe has become the most publicly traded speaking place on the internet for the sole purpose of attempting to drop the weight that I've carried with my life. This is more of a personal cleanse than an attempt to intrigue. And if no one hears this and it becomes buried, I would have at least gotten it off my chest. I am not from here. And by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I mean where any of us live. Anyone hearing this right now? It's now a few days after my 30th birthday. And this time of year, it always strikes me. 
because I started kindergarten on my birthday when I turned five. I thought at the time everyone did that. You turned five, and when you turned five, you go to school. I didn't realize my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school. And a little over one year later, in about two weeks time, it would have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in San Diego and lived in a poorer suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived in an apartment complex called Lemon Vine Apartments that were a bit of a slummier version of the Lemon Vine Apartments found in Lemon Grove, a suburb of San Diego. My parents were divorced but friendly. My mother was young when she had me and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was aspiring to be a model and would regularly take trips to LA to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone being one quarter Indian. Indian, not native. And it gave her an exotic look. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she would go to LA and I would stay with my dad who worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly and we even did Christmas together as a family even though they had split when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mum, who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six, so if there was drama behind the scenes, they did a good job of hiding it from me. On September 17th, 1996, I was staying at my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. No horses or sheep or anything, but my grandma had several pet ducks that would eat seeds from your hand, fly away, and return every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week, and my mum was in LA, so I stayed with my grandparents. Schools back then were pretty cool with this kind of thing, and I was sent home with the sort of nonsense assignment you'd expect a first grader who'd just gone back to school after summer break ended. The 17th was the third day. I was staying with my grandparents and my grandpa had told me to be careful outside because he'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it had went to. So, since no one knew where the mystery snake had gotten off to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old go looking around a farm for a rattlesnake was probably not in any parenting 101 handbook, but it was the 90s and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property, but I wasn't allowed to go in there, so they'd probably figure that's where the snake had gotten off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this rattlesnake, and much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, which, for those who don't have one, Looks kind of like one of the green electrical boxes on the north side of the road. There it was, curled up, rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them I found it. Now, this might be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure the snake was 900 feet long at least, give or take. I found it though and I was excited to tell my grandpa I'd found it so he could do what he did and go out and shoot the thing. I ran in the back door of the house, which led you to the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room, expecting to see my grandparents, my uncle, and the neighboring couple all sat in the living room where I'd left them. Except they weren't there, and it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. The hard and memorable, uncomfortable hardwood furniture my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table he made out of a tree stump was gone, replaced by a fluffy grandma-looking furniture, a three-person sofa with a floral design on it. The TV was in the wrong place and newer than grandpa's old sit-on-the-ground cabinet TV. The hardwood paneling on the walls was gone, or at least covered by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy off-white carpet. 
The pictures of my dad, my uncle and me and my grandparents were gone from the walls, replaced by paintings and pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by this, I was more confused by everyone being missing. In my six-year-old brain, I accepted that they may have completely rearranged the house while I'd spent the day looking for a snake, but I didn't believe at all that they'd just leave me alone. And I didn't see anyone leave. I didn't see the cars go. So I walked out the front door, which was attached to the living room, as they usually are, and thought maybe they'd gone to the chickens or pigs, both of which should have been visible from the front porch. But the chicken coop was gone. The pig pen had lost its fencing and there were no pigs to be found. At this point, I was beyond confused and I was getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone. I didn't see anyone. Even though they lived on a small farm, the neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road. So I ran down our dirt driveway and across the road to their house, assuming that it must have been where they went. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house and started crying when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house it used to be. It wasn't even the right house anymore. Nevertheless, I banged on the door. I remember at this point I was crying quite profusely because I didn't understand what was happening. And I kept wiping my face, which covered it in dirt after having been digged around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened, a woman in her late 40s to early 50s answered, and I'd never seen her before. I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after this point is largely a blur, because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived. But I met the people who lived there, where my grandparents lived. And they were not my grandparents. I did not know them. I begged for them to get my uncle and tell him who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Through a series of various police and people in suits, I was brought back to the town in which I lived. After spending what seemed like 10 hours in the local police station trying to contact my parents, I had my home phone number memorized, but told them my dad would be asleep. But when they called that number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address and sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went to my address. When they finally called the station back, they were informed that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments didn't exist and the address I gave to them was an apartment complex called Merritt Manor and the apartment number I gave them was unoccupied. I believe at this point, they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name of the apartment and the wrong apartment number, but I did in fact live there. When I was finally brought to my hometown after changing hands a few times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my addresses again and was driven to where I lived. That was it. That was my apartment complex. But just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color. And the sign that used to have a large image of a lemon reading lemon vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived. And they said, no one lives there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, all of whom knew me. None of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person who came out of the apartment building around me were the wrong people, and they didn't know me. From this point, they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy as he worked for the city. But no employee by his name apparently worked for the city in any capacity. As day turned to night, I spent endless hours sitting in the police station as they attempted to find any person in the world who knew me. I couldn't do anything but cry and cry and cry endlessly. A woman in a suit who I think was either a detective or just someone who happened to work at the station sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy, that looked a bit like one of the dogs from 101 Dalmatians and told me his name was Sparky. She said I could keep Sparky and that when they found my parents, Sparky would go home with me and make sure I didn't get lost again. She said he was a good dog and he'd protect me if I took care of him. During this time, they attempted my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. 
it was easy to find, it was really close to where I lived. But a school by such a name as you guessed it did not exist. My school was now apparently called Anza Elementary. At one point I was asked if the police had ever taken my fingerprint, and they had. In kindergarten my entire class had our fingerprints taken by the police, at the school gym, for basically this exact reason. Unsurprisingly, this didn't help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbours, my apartment, or even me. They couldn't find me. I was too young to remember what my social security number was, but I severely doubt it mattered. They asked my birthday, any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged. But nothing I told them turned up any information about me. At some point during the day I was briefly taken to the ER, as police suspected I may have sustained some kind of head injury. After being looked over by a doctor, they found nothing wrong with me, and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with someone that night. I'm not entirely sure who it was. Someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening at this point. I cried myself to sleep several times in the police station and cried myself to sleep again at the house I stayed in at the night. Despite the woman who I was staying with, not the same one who gave me Sparky, doing everything in her power to calm me down. I clung to Sparky so hard I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have a picture of my mum. I didn't know what was going on and no one could find out where I belonged. This didn't make sense to me. I was only six, just barely. I lived where I lived, and my parents were my parents, and my school was my school. They didn't just all disappear in one day. In between fits of crying and waking up, I begged to just go home. I begged for the lady that I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go home. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times, at different places, at all hours of the day. Police, investigators, people from departments I still don't know, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station, the house I was staying at, until eventually someone told me that they thought they'd located my parents and they were coming to get me. Finally. I was going home. Finally this was over. Finally I could get away from all these strange people asking me the same question over and over. When the couple showed up at the police station my heart fell into my feet. They weren't my parents, but they'd had a son that had gone missing and I fit his description pretty close. The woman started crying when she saw me, because she immediately knew I wasn't her missing son. But I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually I was collected by child services, and I was taken to a foster family where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign asking for anyone to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers to put in the news. I never let go of Sparky for a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo because I didn't have him when I arrived. But I needed him, and I would throw an immense tantrum when someone tried to take him away. They had put me back on the clothes I was wearing when they found me, but they'd since given me new clothes to wear. In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the houses to see if I was their child. I didn't realise this was what was happening until I was older, and looked back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say, is this your kid? They were a bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing I wasn't their missing child, they'd often leave in tears. Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back, I felt so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain. Like a type of guilt. Like I wish I had been their child, so they could have taken me back. And now, they were safe. Most of those people probably never saw their children again. But I try and imagine that all of them were reunited, even though I know that isn't likely. The guilt was one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult. But like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed me.
The most common belief suggested to me has been that I was abandoned as a child and lived in an abusive home, dumped on the side of a dirt road in the middle of farmland, and I repressed all the negative memories I had of my past. I didn't stay in that foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I needed to start going to school. I needed identification, and I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year. But the day and month were listed as September 17th, the day I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth, but I imagine it's because they didn't think I knew what it was. My name was unchanged. I started going to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists who had seen me recommended I not be placed back into full curriculum immediately, and suspected I suffered some form of PTSD. I was put in special classes, and was only made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually, I started going full-time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was placed up for adoption. I was never actually told I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after I was found. But eventually, people started coming to meet me. But these people weren't looking for a missing child. They were looking to adopt me. But I definitely did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that no one believed or could verify. I insisted my parents would eventually find me, and I rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story does not have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18, and went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency, and I did a brief stint in something similar to Juvie in San Diego called Chaparral. I never went to college, never really started getting my life together until I was around 24. I haven't spoken publicly about this before now, not at least since I was a child speaking to everyone who was trying to figure out where I came from. I still have Sparky. He's old, he's worn, still in one piece, no longer white, he's now a dark shade of grey. He sits on my dresser and is there, just like he's always been, as long as I've been here. I've also been asked a handful of questions, which I think I will address now. The first question is, what things are different in places you came from compared to where you are now? To answer, I'm not really sure. I've been asked about countries, states, laws, planets, languages, you name it. The fact is I don't really know. I was six. The continents could have been completely different and I would have had no idea. I wasn't particularly bright either. I mean, I was hunting for rattlesnakes. I also thought California was a country. I can say the President of the United States was not Bill Clinton. I can't remember exactly what his name was, but we had to learn it in kindergarten. I think his name might have been Robert or something. I want to say Robert Wilmer, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, that's my story. I doubt anyone will hear this, and it's likely to be buried within 15 minutes. But it's now off my chest and in the open, and hopefully I can go to sleep with a little bit more weight off. When I was around 12, I lived in a new high-rise building with my family that felt a little... off. Several times when I was able to convince my parents that it's okay to go out and leave me to watch TV alone, I would start hearing voices coming from the direction of the bedrooms that were identical to my family members, as well as the distinct sounds of my mother's high heels, clear as day. There was also this one time where I woke up very early in the morning, walked over to the sitting room to watch a show that only aired at that particular time. Fifteen minutes after sitting on the sofa, I started hearing a knocking sound on the glass window a few meters behind me. Now, we lived three floors up. There were no trees or wires or anything that could touch the glass. No sill for birds to stand on, and no other buildings in front of the window either. The knocking kept going for a good 10 minutes, before it suddenly stopped. I was too terrified to turn and look. It never happened again, during that time or any other time of day. The apartment also had a small guest bathroom that was shaped like a narrow corridor. 
When you stepped in, there were two sinks on your right and a small room at the end of the door with the toilet itself. That little room scared the bejesus out of everyone. It was fine when you were using it and in it, but the moment you turned your back or were leaving it, this intense sense of absolute fear would set in every fibre of your conscious being and scream run. We moved out a year later and thankfully never saw what was causing the noises. Still boggles my mind thinking about it, considering there was nothing on that land before the building was erected. Me and my brother are now both in our thirties and the topic of the bathroom came up. Before I told him how I felt, he said he was also terrified of going in there, though no one ever said anything about it at the time. I've had a handful of paranormal experiences in my life. I would like to eventually share them all, but this was the first experience and it really scared me growing up. I haven't told many people, as it's kind of hard to bring up what you've seen, like a ghost in normal conversations. Nevertheless, I wanted to share my experience with all of you to see what you think. I was 12 years old at the time, and my parents were in the early stages of a fairly nasty divorce. There was about a month long spam when my brothers and I knew something was up. My parents would have hushed arguments late into the night with the occasional outburst. These arguments normally ended with my mother leaving to stay at a friend's house for the night. One night during this period, I awoke to the sound of one of their brief outbursts. I immediately noticed it was significantly darker in our room than normal. We always slept with our bedroom door open and the hallway bathroom light on. However, tonight my door had been shut. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary during this time since my parents would close our door when they were arguing in an attempt not to wake us. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I noticed the silhouette of a figure in front of my closed bedroom door. The best I can describe it, and bear with me here, is that it was a human shaped dark gray form. It was semi-transparent and perhaps five foot four or so. The figure was definitely human shaped, but had no details. I couldn't make out a face or any features. It seemed to have the shape or maybe the feel of a woman, which I know sounds crazy. Its transparency increased towards the knees leading up to no feet, kind of like your stereotypical Casper ghost without the little tail. It stayed completely still, but also seemed to be moving within itself, maybe like a swirling mist. I would make out a definitive outline and figure that I knew was abnormal. I was mortified. I stayed frozen in my bed for what seemed like forever, keeping my eyes locked on whatever was in my room. I felt like it was staring at me the whole time and was aware I saw it. I could still hear my parents hushed arguments in the kitchen and decided getting to them was my only option for safety. However, this thing in my room was between me and them. Honestly, I do not know what the hell I was thinking, but I made a run for it. To this day, I can still vividly remember running as fast as I could straight at the figure, bracing for impact with it watching it vanish as I went through it and slamming straight into my bedroom door, which is a little humorous looking back on it. But I remained composure, opened my bedroom door and sprinted to the kitchen. By the time I reached the kitchen, my mum had just left and my dad was shutting the garage door. I really can't remember what I told him, but I know I didn't tell him what had just happened. I'm pretty sure I just said I had a nightmare and wanted to sleep in his bed with him that night. He agreed and we went down the hallway to his room. I remember clutching onto him as we passed my bedroom and asking what was going on. But the rest of the night was uneventful. My parents officially separated about a week later and for the next few months I had an extremely rough time sleeping at my dad's house. I would wake up in the middle of the night and would frequently stare at my doorway for the watching figure. Most of the time when this happened, I would run to my dad's room and get into bed with him. I remember him asking what was going on, but I'd never tell him. I just said I was scared. And I'm sure he chalked it up to a child struggling with a divorce. I'm 27 now, and I think about this experience from time to time. 
I told my parents about that night a few years ago, and they both have each had their own unrelated paranormal experiences in their lives, and are open to the possibility that I truly did have a paranormal experience that night. My dad a little more so than mum. Any time we have talked about that night, she gets a little weird and says, I could have dreamt the whole thing, but I know what I saw. Upon further reflection, I really don't think that it was a negative being. I was scared at the time, but never felt like it wanted to hurt me. I think I was more scared of not knowing what it was and knowing that it wasn't normal. Sometimes I feel like it could have been a relative, perhaps my grandmother who had passed away that was watching over my brothers and I while we slept, or while we were going through the divorce. Regardless of what it was, it really changed my life, and I wanted to share this with all of you. When I was a kid, my family planned a trip to New York. We were going to take the train all the way to New York from Oklahoma. At the time, the nearest train station was in Kansas, so we had to drive there first. We left our house in the early morning with plenty of time to make our train, which left at 9 or 10 at night. After driving all day, we made it to Kansas, but somehow got completely and hopelessly lost looking for the train station. For hours, we drove on empty country roads that seemed endless. This was the 90s, and well before GPS or the average person having cell phones. All we had was a useless map, and when I say these roads were empty, I mean there was nothing. No gas station, no houses, no stores. Just absolutely endless grassland, as far as the eye could see. It was night now, and pitch black due to the lack of street lamps, other cars, or buildings. The whole area seemed completely dead and abandoned. Finally, with about 20 minutes to spare before our train left, we stumbled across an old building with a payphone inside. The building was run down and looked like it had been abandoned, but may have been a gas station at one point. My mum got out of the car and called the cops for help. By now, all of us kids were crying and freaking out, afraid we would miss our train. We had never been on a train before, and we had been so excited about this trip for months. My dad was in a horrid mood, because we had driven all day long to make it on time, and we should have arrived at the station hours ago. Now we only had minutes to get help and find the station. It seemed absolutely hopeless that we would make it there on time. There was no one around, and we knew it would take the police forever to get to us, here in the middle of nowhere. That's when things got weird. My mum hung up the phone and came back to the car. And the second she got in and closed the door, a cop pulled up out of nowhere. I'm telling you, there was nothing on this road for miles and miles. There was no possible way for the police on the phone to have sent someone in the time it took for my mum to hang up and walk a few feet back to our car. Even if the cop had been in the area, it would have still taken a few minutes for him to get the call on his radio. I'm telling you that only seconds had passed from the moment she hung up the phone. But the cop knew all about us. He knew we'd called, that we were lost and looking for the station. He was incredibly nice and told us to follow him, and also that if we did the speed limit, we wouldn't make it. I remember that distinctly, because it was not something a cop would normally say. He didn't seem like an ordinary cop at all. He seemed to know everything about our situation, almost as if he knew us personally. We followed the cop out of the deserted parking lot, and within seconds were in the train station. It seemed to appear out of the darkness like a mirage. There had not been any signs pointing to it, and there was absolutely nothing else around. We made it to the train with about 10 minutes to spare, waiting for it. To this day, we still talk about it as a family, and wonder how it was possible for the cops to have gotten to us that fast on a dark, deserted country road with nothing around for miles. We also have no idea how we were so close to the train station, my mum thinks the cop was an angel, and I don't know what to think. It was one of the weirdest things I have ever experienced, and to this day I can't explain what happened, or who that cop was, or how we got to the station that night. In October, for fun, 
I booked a tour for myself and my boyfriend done by an incredible company here in Canada. I've taken tours with them before, and I loved their storytelling, knowledge of history, and my region, and it was a nice, outdoor, socially distanced activity for my boyfriend and I. The tour itself was of a nighttime tour of a historical pioneer village with buildings dating back to the 1800s. I'd been there before many times as it's a very popular spot for a school day trip and overall a beautiful couple of acres of historic buildings from across my province having been transported to recreate a historic village. The tour was going great and the guide was telling some interesting stories and history. We had visited the barns, old mills, original house of the first family that settled there, the church and the cemetery. I hadn't felt anything all night except just some hyper-awareness of my surroundings. But as we approached a house, the guide asked if we would like to hear the next story from inside or outside the house. The group enthusiastically said inside, and the guy said, Okay, just know that you made that choice. As we entered the house, I immediately felt uneasy. The inside felt heavy, and the energy sticky. Making our way into a room, I felt my head begin to pound. I spoke up to the guide saying, I do not like this house, I'm getting a headache. Another woman in the group said she was also feeling a headache and lightheadedness. As the guide told me that many people felt that way, and they'd even had people faint inside the house on tours before, and encouraged us to step outside if we felt the same. I felt this force pushing on my shoulders, pressing them inwards, as though the house was caving in on me, pressing me in every direction. I'd never felt anything of the sort and spoke up, leaving the house with my boyfriend. He followed to make sure I was okay. As soon as my foot crossed the threshold of the house, my pounding and headache and pressure went away as though lifted off me. As I turn around to perhaps go back into the house because I felt a little silly and wanted to hear the story, my feet would not let me go back towards it. I was physically unable to move my body in the direction of the door. The guide finished telling the story of the house and came outside to tell me the story and ensure that I was okay while the rest of the group finished taking a look and taking flash photos to see if they could catch pictures of departed souls. It turns out the house belonged to a rather angry reverend and was originally located in my hometown about an hour and a half north, a few streets away from where I grew up in fact. It was relocated to the historic town. The reverend was an angry man who tended to hit people with a Bible, saying he would pound the word of God into their head. This is the time I add that I do not necessarily believe in religion and consider myself more agnostic. They have also blocked off the top of the house because so many people have been pushed down the stairs by unseen hands. Children have also reported, the man upstairs does not want us up here. The rest of the tour went off without any further experiences, but that was just the strangest thing that I can't explain. I guess the Reverend did not like an agnostic godless woman in his house. I used to work in music and toured with this band. The guitarist called Josh of the band had a best friend called Matt who died a few years back. He always talked about the kid and seemed like a great guy. Josh always had this reoccurring dream where Matt was standing on this abandoned street which supposedly was metaphorical for purgatory. Josh had all these conversations with Matt in these dreams and because he had overdosed unexpectedly, he felt like his spirit was not able to move on. At the end of the dream, Matt would take a bulb from the street light on the street they were standing in the middle of. Josh described these dreams in extreme detail, and I could pretty much picture what the street looked like. Fast forward to about six months into touring with these guys. They are huge Bright Eyes fans and wanted to stop in Casadaga, Florida. As the Bright Eyes singer, wrote an album there, and it's a really creepy and spiritual place. It might be worth noting that six out of seven of the people I was with are all atheists. So we drive into Casadaga, about 2 or 3 a.m. and drive around. Suddenly, this black dog comes into the middle of the road and just stops and looks at us. The guy in the band were all weirded out and were just saying things like, 
follow the dog, it's trying to show us something. And in my mind I'm thinking, these guys are idiots. We follow the dog for a few blocks, and it was just walking pretty slowly. All of a sudden we turn a street and the dog bolts. We try to speed up, but Josh says, stop the van, this is it. We're all confused. He gets out of the van and looks around. This is it, this is the street in my dream. We hang out for about 15 minutes, and the way he described the street, from having houses on the left to a park on the right, it was definitely a street. The one from the dream. As we get in the van, a street light goes off and we just drive off. He claimed he never had any more dreams about it, and it was closure on everything. To give some background, we are a young professional couple in our late twenties, and this happened three years ago. Personally, I've always believed in the paranormal, as I've had a few experiences growing up. My dad also works as a medium and paranormal investigator. He taught me to always to be skeptical and look for a logical explanation, but my upbringing also gave me an open mind. In contrast, my partner Andy is not a believer in anything like that. He can sometimes be quite scathing on the whole subject. We were looking to move closer to my work in a town called Stroud in the county of Gloucestershire, England. We had two cats, so it was hard to find a landlord that accepted pets. We saw this gorgeous property become available after a month of searching. It was a 16th century cottage on the outskirts of town. It had been used as a mill hop in the 16th and 17th century and had then been turned into a residential property around the mid 1800s. As soon as we went inside, we fell in love with it. It had two large downstairs reception rooms, a spacious kitchen and three big bedrooms upstairs. There was also a strange little door under the stairs that led to an enormous basement area. Walking around during the viewing, I did feel a little on edge as the atmosphere in an upstairs bedroom and the front room downstairs felt a bit heavy. I reminded myself that it was probably just in my head and we went ahead and put the deposit down to make it ours. On our moving day, the landlord met us and talked us through everything. He mentioned that the staircase was not original and that it had been taken from a theater in Oxfordshire and installed in the house. He was very good at working with wood. This might seem like a random fact, but we later had experiences on that staircase, so I do wonder if it held any residual energy. We moved in, and it was as stressful as any moving day was. We were both knackered by the evening, and once the bed was up, we agreed to have an early night. We chose a back bedroom as our main one, the one I had felt the heavy atmosphere in, as it was the biggest, and you couldn't hear the road from there. The house was right on a main road that led up to the Cotswolds Hills. We are lying in bed chatting when I felt the atmosphere change and get heavy and dark. I said as much to Andy who told me I was just tired, and slowly I started to see small slivers and blue lights appear in the air. They were about the size of a 5p coin and would appear gliding slowly through the air, leaving a glowing after trail behind them. I pointed them out to Andy and was surprised when he said that he could see them as well. As we were facing away from the road, I don't think it could have been car headlights and they moved in arcs and erratically anyway. This lasted for about 10 minutes and then they slowly faded away and the atmosphere lifted. I was surprised that we had both witnessed it. Andy took a picture, which you can see on screen. From that day, we started to have small little things happen around the house. One of the most common was to hear footsteps walk up and down the stairs and landing. This scared me very much when I first heard it, as I would often be home in the evening and would be alone when I did. It was loud enough for me to think it was a burglar and to hide in the back room and call Andy. Of course, when we checked, no one was there. It was certainly too loud a noise for our cats to make and we believed they were downstairs with me at the time anyway. Another occurrence was that objects and ornaments would be moved around. We would find heavy ornaments carefully placed on the floor and also in the hallway, a whole room away from where they had been originally. 
I also used to randomly find large pine cones placed on the stairs and on the sofa. We were not near any pine trees and did not own any pine cone ornaments. This was all bearable, but I did feel uncomfortable on my own, especially in the front room of the house, which was a long panelled reception room with a big fireplace. The fireplace had a heavy iron grate that we also would come home to find moved across the room seemingly by itself. It always seemed like someone was standing in the corner of the room watching me. I felt silly saying this to Andy, but at a later date he also said that that particular corner made him feel watched. A year went by with these small strange things happening. We were mostly unconcerned with it, until the activity seemingly started to get more intense. One of the first things to happen was the basement door started opening by itself. This was strange as it had a knob you had to physically turn to open and then pull it quite hard. It would also jam quite easily and I had to get a knife to unjam it often. We would then come down in the morning and it would be wide open, sometimes with the basement lights on too. Our electrical also seemed to go haywire at this point. My partner had a computer tower in our bedroom with a large push down button that you had to hold down to turn it on. It made a loud, very characteristic whoosh sound when it started up. It started to turn itself on quite often, noticeably at 5am when we were both asleep. I'm a very light sleeper, so it would always wake me up. Now we have kept that computer in motion since, and it has not turned itself on in that manner. The TV would turn itself on though, as would the lamp that we kept in our bedroom. I would wake up to the light being on full whack. It had an adjustment slider. Our bedroom window would also open itself in the middle of the night. It had a heavy latch that I could hear unhook itself and it would then swing open and crack loudly against the side of the house. When we first moved, our bed was directly under this window, which made me uncomfortable for some reason. Hearing and seeing it open in the night was incredibly unnerving. We did then move the bed, and I felt a little more comfortable afterwards. One of the scariest things was that we would start to hear voices around the house. If either of us used the toilet on the landing, we would sometimes hear what I can only describe as a deep male mumbling outside the door. This sometimes happened when either one of us was on our own in the house. Andy also experienced someone tapping on the door, which I also heard from downstairs. I frequently heard my name called from different parts of the house by a female voice. Stupidly, I did make my own Ouija board from paper and tried to contact the spirit to see what it wanted. Nothing happened, except that I felt very uncomfortable afterwards. So much so that I picked the makeshift Ouija up and put it in the rubbish bin outside. Two days later, the Ouija paper reappeared on my coffee table seemingly unmarked. This scared me so much that I then burnt it. I did question Andy, but he had no reason to go through the bin and would not have been remotely interested in the Ouija anyway. Around this time, I asked my dad to come over for lunch one day and he brought his dog, a lovely big Akita with him. He was a very gentle dog who rarely growled and got aggressive. The dog was incredibly reluctant to come through the front door, and when he did, we couldn't make him move from a spot just below the staircase. He stood rigid, all fur on end, ears back and growled up at the stairs. He did this for about 20 minutes, and then yelped and ran into the front room. The cats were safely popped in the back room downstairs, and there was no one else in the house but me, my dad and the dog. Andy would cycle home, on an evening after work. Now as he cycled up the road, the side of the house would become visible. You could see the kitchen, the upstairs bathroom window, and also the window to our spare room upstairs. On this particular evening, I was cooking in the kitchen downstairs and saw Andy's bicycle lamp approach from the road. I waved and he waved back and came inside. When he came in, he said, oh, I didn't know you had your sister over. I was baffled as it was just me and told him so. He went white and told us that our upstairs spare room light was on and that he'd seen a figure pulled back against the curtains wave to him 
and then go behind the curtain. We both ran upstairs and of course there was no one there at all. Just the light on that I had not turned on. There are too many small things to list entirely. But some notable mentions are that Andy was having sleep paralysis one night and screamed awfully until I woke him up. He said he had seen a white figure approaching slowly up the bed. This has been the one time this has ever happened to him. Our power box once switched off, even though the neighbors were fine. Our power switched off, even though the neighbors were fine. So we looked to our power box and switched it all back on and joked that it must have been the ghost. We went upstairs after this and it shut off again by itself. I also saw a lady in an old fashioned nurse's uniform in my dream. She walked into our bedroom and smiled at us. There was an ornament that was flying gently off the unit while I watched and then it landed gently to the floor. Towards the end of our tenancy, we had two things happen that stuck with me. It was a stressful time and the atmosphere was not great anyway. One night we were both in bed reading. On the back of our bedroom door was a hook and on the hook, I had hung a fairly large slate heart. We were reading quietly when we both suddenly looked up at the door. The heart started to swing upwards in the air as if someone were holding it and then slammed back down on the door so hard it made the frame shake. We both leapt up and checked the landing outside our bedroom. It was freezing cold and had an extremely unfriendly feel to it. On our very last day, we had help from Andy's parents. I'd hung up the original pictures back on the wall in the front room. They were all very secure. I can't remember properly, but I believe that we had an altercation with a rude neighbor over parking and Andy and his mum got very agitated. We all stood in the hallway and there were some raised voices. Suddenly there was a huge crack from the front room. The pictures that I had just hung carefully were all on the floor. The string was intact as were the hooks that I'd hung them up on, and we all made a hasty retreat. It's also worth mentioning that since we've lived there, the house has had quite a lot of different tenants, who all seem to move out within a few months. Seems we're not the only one who were plagued by paranormal activity. I am from Germany. Back in 2011, our family moved from my childhood home village to a nearby town called Buchberg. We moved into a half-timbered house from the 16th century, which was a listed building. My mother had just taken over a restaurant and was always very stressed at this point. I was 12 years old and had to grow up very early because my mother had to be able to rely on me while she had to take care of her restaurant. Me and my sister's room were outside my parents' apartment and had a real front door, so to speak of. As it was such an old building, the floor consisted almost entirely of wooden floorboards, which in isolated places creaks quite thickly when you step on them. One of those places was right at the entrance of my room, maybe two or three steps away from the door, which was also one of the loudest places you could step on. But these spots only creaked when there was lengthy weight on it. So it wasn't enough if I threw a shirt there or something. After living there for about a year and a half, I woke up for the first time through the creaking of the floorboards in the middle of the night, which I couldn't really understand at this point since I only woke up. And since I couldn't find an explanation, I dismissed it as a normal sound made by the wood and went back to sleep with a quite easy feeling. For weeks, nothing happened until I woke up again to this squeaking. This time, not as sleepy as the last. I quickly realized it wasn't normal. It was loud and violent, as if someone was standing on the squeaky spot intentionally. I thought I was going completely crazy and could no longer trust my perception after the floorboards did not stop creaking for more than a minute. I couldn't take it anymore and ran over to my mother's bedroom and told her crying what was going on. My mother still thinks that I dreamt it. And so the squeak happened every now and then, and over time I gradually lost the fear of it. It was around nine or 10 months since the first incident when something new happened. The door would open and close by itself. 
one of our faucets suddenly turned on in the middle of the night, and our cats would just stare at nothing and start hissing and growling. The longer we lived there, my entire gut feeling became increasingly more uncomfortable. I would more often than not feel that I wasn't alone. It was almost as if I had someone sitting on my shoulder who was with me no matter where I was. It was almost overwhelming. And then there was the one night after which I couldn't sleep in my room for three weeks or so. I was in my bed just before falling asleep in the evening when that stupid squeaking of the floorboard started again. In the meantime, more annoyed than fearful, I pressed my pillow onto my ears in the hopes that it would soon stop. But this time it was different. It didn't stop after the usual two to three minutes, but went on for 15 and slowly got louder and more intense until I looked up at some point. What I saw almost gave me a heart attack and I could literally feel a shockwave go through my whole body together with goosebumps. I was so scared that I nearly vomited. I saw someone standing at the foot of my bed about five feet away just staring. Because of the shock, I was frozen and stared back for what felt like ages. In these fractional moments, I could see what was there. It looked like an old woman with a long shirt and curly hair. This expression on her face, it was disappointed, almost angry. But as I saw and realized all these things, she was gone again. I slept on our couch for a few more weeks. My mother didn't want to believe all of this. It seemed to me as if I were the only one who had noticed all these strange things. I think it was anywhere from a month to three months after the night I saw the old woman. At that point, I turned 14. I came home from the cinema where I watched the second part of the Hobbit series with buddies. Later that evening, I was lying in my bed thinking about the film and what happened in it, when from one second to the other, the floorboards began creaking again. That was the first time after the incident with the old woman that it squealed again, and fear rose up me like I'd never felt it before. I had hoped so much that the noises would just stop right away, but I was wrong. It was just like the last time, but this time I did not dare look to what made the noise. As I was lying there and the noises didn't stop, a feeling came over me that it won't stop until I looked. Finally, I gave in. And when I looked, I was as shocked as the first time to see another person standing there, but this time someone different from the old woman, a man in his mid thirties with old clothes and a helmet with a broken lamp and a dirty face. Like the old woman, he just stood there and stared at me for a few seconds, wearing the same expression as her before he vanished. Fortunately for me, we moved out a few weeks later, which is how everything ended and since then nothing has happened to me. I myself never believed in such things as the paranormal and even made fun of people who said they did. But I don't tell this to anyone now because no one believes me and they'll think I'm crazy for believing it myself. I can't categorize it properly, but I'm sure that I have some kind of trauma for it. And I'm confident that ghosts are real. I'm not a superstitious or generally spiritual person, but in high school, I was in the drum light and we practiced early in the morning prior to starting school. We were inside the band room that day because it was fairly cold. So anyway, I'm doing my thing playing the tenors, and I drop one of my mallets. I turn to pick it up and can't find it. There is about 10 feet of open bare floor surrounding me, and it's nowhere to be found. My instructor stops us and basically just asks me what the problem is. So several of us start searching around but can't find it. I say screw it, grab my spare set, and about 20 minutes later the band director walks in and locks his office, sits on his desk, and knocks on the window. I look up, and he picks up the mallet from his desk with a look like, what is this doing here? I could verify that it was mine because I marked each set. Nobody had gone in or out. There's no gap under the door, it's a locked room, and it somehow ended up on the desk. There were 15 of us in that room at the time, and there was a unanimous nope at that moment. I was stunned, and one of my bodies became unglued. We pretty much cancelled the rest of the rehearsal right there and then, 
and many of us were pretty bugged out about the rest of the day. I couldn't concentrate on anything for almost a week after that. Eventually, my brain just filed it away under unsolved mysteries, and we ended up carrying on with life. I live in a town that was founded around 1830, and has seen more than its fair share of death, war, and massacres. So much so, that lots of people are claimed to be haunted here, and you can walk over spots that hundreds perished on. I would even wager to say that the land I currently live on has most likely had a few soldiers die on both sides of the Civil War. Now, to what I experienced. I woke up one night past midnight, my dog rolled over in bed, and I opened my eyes in the near pitch black room with a view of the corner next to my covered window, and from the corner of my eye I see something moving by the opposite side of the room, and there it is. A man dressed in a dirty, but not torn or raggedy, confederate uniform. I was afraid someone had broken in, but before I could even decide what to do, he floated with his head, nearly touching the ceiling to the corner of the room by the window, and stopped. He went through the wall, and he seemed to notice I was awake, and gave a sort of oops smile that unsettled me. I felt afraid and debated whether I should wake my fiancé or not. But before I could finish deciding, I was so tired I fell back asleep, and only truly thought about what happened when I awoke that morning. The entire ordeal only lasted perhaps ten seconds, but it was one of the strangest things I have ever seen in my life. I have a history of waking up and seeing small bugs for a few seconds, but I have never seen anything so large or vivid since. And I know it couldn't have been a dream, because in my dreams I have no sensation, but I did when this happened. This has honestly been bothering me for a while. Did I see something I wasn't meant to, or was it a strange mind trick? Has anyone ever had anything similar happen to them? I was a sophomore in high school, at my girlfriend's house watching a movie. It was around 10pm when the flick ended, and I proceeded to skateboard home, as I only lived two blocks away and it was a pretty quiet suburban neighbourhood. I'm skating down the hill towards a larger street, larger but never really busy, especially not at night. When I reached the intersection I nail a rock. I had planned on blasting across the street since there were no cars coming in either direction. I fly off the board, skid a good three to four feet on my head, right shoulder, hip and knee. I rolled to my back and screamed out in agony. The pain was so bad I couldn't really move. I looked up the road about 30 yards off and a car is coming straight down the way. And where I landed, I was right in its path, two lane street. I was right in the middle of its lane, my head aligned with the wheel. I tried like hell to move and scream but couldn't do anything. The car was 15 yards off. He didn't see me, made no attempt to swerve, 10 yards. I heard him barreling down and I closed my eyes, bracing for the worst. Nothing. I opened my eyes, looked where the car had been. Nothing. Hear the car behind me. Look where it was supposed to be in the other direction. Tail lights cruising up the road. I hadn't moved. He hadn't swerved. It was like he passed through me. Or I passed through him. There isn't really any way he could have passed over me. Not with the way I had landed, and I was positioned in the street. It was a little car. I can't explain it. I got up terrified, bloodied and baffled, hobbled home, and went to sleep. No one believed me. But it's true. It was October 11th, 2001. One month after 9-11, I was 14 years old and my grandfather died in his sleep, an empty bottle of whiskey at his bedside. I was devastated. He was the best grandpa, and I could tell I was his favourite. At his funeral, I remember standing at his burial ceremony. I was a little further back than most of our family. I needed my space and I was grieving hard. 
I remember closing my eyes, folding my arms, and burying my head into my jacket, then crying. My mom then put her arm around me and cried with me. I felt her, heard her crying into my cheek, her voice mauled by my jacket. She let go when I opened my eyes. What I saw made my heart skip a beat. My mother was standing 20 feet in front of me. Everyone was. I looked around and realized I was completely alone the whole time. I don't know who hugged me. Maybe it was my grandpa. Maybe I mistook my grandpa's voice for my mother's. And to this day, I'm still a little bit creeped out. I remember being pretty young, like nine or 10. And I was in the car park of a pub in England, South End. I remember seeing someone in their teens in the window of a house looking over the car park. They waved at me and I felt like I knew them somehow. My parents asked me who I was waving to and I just said some lady in the window over there. Didn't think much of it. Fast forward 10 years, I was at my grandma's house. I remember walking into her room, which I was never allowed to do and going to the window. I then realized I was in the house looking over that same parking lot and remembering their interaction years before. Then a girl around nine or 10 who was in said car park waved at me and I waved back and I felt like I knew her. Could not explain it and I've never told it to anyone, but it still freaks me out. A few years ago, I was about 10 or 11. During one family gathering, my dad and his siblings, my aunt and uncles, talked about their past experience in the old house that they were renting way back when they didn't have kids, me and my cousins. They talked about this ghost kid that was in the house running around and playing and making fun of them once in a while. I can tell you the detailed story about their experiences with the ghost kids, but let's focus on mine. And they kept talking about how the kid also lived in the same old house and perished in it, and the kid didn't receive a proper burial. I didn't believe that this ghost kid existed until this experience of mine. Me and my younger sister visited my cousin's house, aka the old house that they rented back then, since we lived in the same neighborhood. This cousin of mine was only four years old. It was only me, my cousin, my younger sister, and my aunt that were in that house. So we hung out and played until lunchtime. My aunt had to go out to buy us food, so me and my sister had to babysit our small cousin for a while. Here's where it gets weird. We were in my little cousin's room. My younger sister was in the bathroom, and I realized we forgot to turn off the TV because I could hear it from my cousin's room. So I went downstairs, turned it off, and went back up. But as I was heading into my cousin's room, I heard him laughing and giggling. So I assumed my sister had finished up with her business and went back into my cousin's room. When we went inside, there was no one else, but my cousin was giggling and facing a corner. So we asked him, hey buddy, why are you laughing? We were playing, he answered. Who's we? He didn't answer and he continued to giggle. So I carried him out of the room and we went back downstairs with my little sister and waited for my aunt to get back. I got goosebumps when the realization hit me. Could this have been the infamous ghost child that they were talking about? This happened about seven-ish years ago when I was 17 and living independently for the first time since leaving the local children's home. The building I lived in was a very old stone cottage that was once used as a pigsty before being converted. On a caravan site that used to be a farm, the place was always freezing cold and always had a weird vibe about it. And a bunch of odd things happened there. But this was the main thing that stuck with me by far. At some point while living there, probably around the six month mark, I lost my keys. It didn't matter to me much, because it was so out in the sticks in rural Wales, UK, that I felt I could confidently leave it unlocked with no bother. And I was able to get spare keys for the other ones that were on the ring. 
or not being too worried or thinking that finding them was very urgent. I did search the place from top to bottom several times over the next seven to eight months, but never found them. Nor did I come across them when I organized cupboards, drawers or moved furnitures around. They were completely gone. One morning I woke up around 10ish and came straight through to the kitchen. The place was a long rectangle with four rooms in a row from right to left. Bedroom, kitchen, bathroom and a tiny hallway with front door, living room to make myself a coffee as usual. And there, right in the middle of the kitchen counter in front of the coffee pot and the kettle, as if I had just left them there the night before were my keys. As you can imagine, I was floored by the perceived nonchalance these inanimate objects were just sitting there with. And instantly my thoughts turned to sleepwalking, downright forgetfulness, etc. But I knew in the back of my mind that none of these explained it. I went to grab them and instantly dropped them because of the searing pain in my hand. They were hot like metal baking trays straight out the oven hot, like they had been sitting under the sun on a corrugated metal roof all day in high summer heat. I made myself coffee, making sure not to touch them, then left them there all day and eventually picked them up and hung them on the hook next to the door and didn't lose them again. Some other strange things that happened are as follows. I would sometimes hear a woman crying outside my window during winter, when there were no guests staying in the caravan or camping section of the park, which was in a different field anyway. Repeatedly, I'd wake up to find a suited man sitting on the end of my bed in the middle of the night. I'm not sure if it was a dream, but it never felt like one. Doors kept opening and closing that I knew were not opened or closed beforehand. Wardrobes being opened and things being dragged out of it while I was out of the room. This happened a lot, no matter how many things I stacked in there. The door on it was one of those that you had to push inward for it to release the catch and open outward, if you get what I mean. The TV would turn itself on and off, flickering lights and bulbs breaking way more than normal. Extra cold and hot spots throughout the building which I often walked through or felt forming and disappearing next to me. I used to sleep with an electric blanket under my bottom sheet and two or three blankets on top of me and occasionally would wake up freezing with one or two of the top layers on the other side of the bedroom. There was no way I could have kicked them that far in my sleep. Once I woke up with my bed a foot away from the wall. It was a diving bed with wheels we are not in an area that experiences earthquakes or anything like that. So how did it move? I moved out when I was 17 and social services don't put kids there anymore due to some unrelated issues that I had with the landowner, which I am glad about in many respects. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. The house which my parents bought and built had an already established building on it, right up to the back of the one acre property. It was a barn style shed with a room up top. You know, two lower side sections and a high mid section. Anyway, since then we renovated it and it's now three times bigger. The reason this property was for sale was the owner had passed away. In this case, inside the shed, working on his car via failing jack. I also enjoy working on my own car and regularly maintain it myself, so you'll often find me weekends or late nights tinkering around on one car or another. This one particular night, I was playing around with my wiring, figuring out some electrical issues and doing a service. All was well and it was around 11.30pm, with everything shut unless you're upstairs. I had been up there earlier as I had some tools and other stuff stashed out of the way. But I hadn't gone into the room, only the top of the stairs, where there's a small area before the walled off room. But every time I'm up there, I checked the door is closed. So back to working on the car, radio is on a low volume and I had pushed a bunch of wiring serviced and rotated my wheels. Idiot me still had the front jacked up from rotating wheels and checking bearings without stands. Yes, I know it's stupid. 
I wasn't going to go under and made sure my limbs and fingers were out the way if anything dropped. I also have a habit of putting the wheel underneath the chassis for a failsafe. I figured I'd scoot under it and pull some wiring out from the rear of the body. The car wasn't going anywhere and the front wheels are barely off the ground as it's at 4x4 with 5 inch lift. So chances of six studs snapping and a car dropping from that is next to nothing. That's when my encounter begins. Once I'm underneath the car in the renovated area, I get this chill like one of those, I got a bad feeling about this kind of chill. And that's when I hear these thunderous steps sprinting from the far end of the upstairs rooms through the shut door down the flight of stairs in four steps. And suddenly the jack drops. Needless to say, I crap the bed, froze like I was stuck in this particular snapshot of space and time. My butt puckered so much, it began to prolapse. I didn't know what to do or where to go, but I sure as hell knew it was not a sheer coincidence. I sat there for 45 minutes, just staring at those stairs. Like if I took my eyes off them for any second, I would be consumed by whatever was up there. Of course, unable to get any assistance as my partner was in the house and the shed's insulated enough that it doesn't get service unless the doors are open. Fortunately, she came looking for me and asked when I was coming home. I heard her coming, yet I was still staring at the stairs. After what seemed like an eternity, she opened the doors and sees me frozen in time, white as a sheet, staring at stairs. When she instantly notices something off, so stays at the door. I finally move and check the jack. Handles unwound completely. A failing ram does not unwind the handle. At this point I explain what happened and we nope the hell out of the shed for the night. On the way I check the window from outside. It was 100% closed. I don't know if this was a coincidence or the old mate trying to teach me a lesson or something or perhaps just wanting me to join him. But I can confirm it is as close as I've been to crapping myself since I was a baby. I haven't had any other strange encounters up there luckily, but I'm sure my days are numbered. I had a friend in high school called Bob. He was very nice and while we weren't that close, we had similar tastes in music and we shared CDs. This was in the late 80s and way before file sharing. We eventually graduated and I moved several hundreds of miles away to college and we lost touch. When I left for college, I had one of Bob's CDs still in my possession, Beat by King Crimson. Fast forward 10 years and I graduated college and was knee deep in my career and finally saved up enough money and bought my first house. In the new house, while I was unpacking, I see the CD in the box. I hadn't noticed it in many years and thought, Gee, I really should track down Bob and return this. Then, at that moment, the doorbell rings. It's Bob. And he says, Hey, you wouldn't happen to still have my King Crimson CD, would you? I'm looking down and holding it in my hand. I hand it to him. And his mouth drops open. Mine probably already is. We exchange pleasantries. I ask him how he found me, but can't remember his answer anymore and he eventually takes off. Haven't seen Bob since. When I was a freshman in high school, my dad and I would go visit my dad's best friend's grandfather, who was a World War II veteran at his apartment. We'd go over there every month. It seemed for the better part of a year. We'd talk, watch movies, or play video game golf on his PS2. His name was Jean. He was a great guy with a big personality. You knew he liked you if he picked fun at you. He was always open about his experiences. He would do anything for almost anyone that had his back. And he was so caring for his grandson and my dad. Most of his other family scammed him and left him. So we were all he really had left. During the war, he trained what I was believed to be Louisiana. Fort Polk, and went through Africa and up through Sicily and Italy, earning a silver or bronze star and two purple hearts for his action. He, at his age, had a lot of health issues 
as he was a big time smoker, severe arthritis and deaf in one ear due to the grenade that earned him one of the Purple Hearts. In July of 2012, he had some sort of heart issue and paramedics had to be called. I only found out because one of his caretakers posted it on Facebook that he was in critical condition. Because of that, I sent him a message telling him to stay strong and informed his grandson, my dad's best friend, and he got on the phone and called him immediately. Shortly after their phone call, he passed away. Now for my encounter. Come my sophomore year for Spanish class, we had Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. And we had to write a letter to a loved one or person who had passed away and seal it off. I wrote it to Jacques, telling him about how I missed him and hopefully how someday I'd get to see him again. That night, I woke up and I could smell his apartment. It was so vivid, I felt like I woke up in his living room. I couldn't see anything as I liked to sleep in the pitch black darkness, but I could feel his presence next to my bedside. Something about the way the figure stood next to my bed was comforting. I called out his name after realizing I felt him there. I reached out for him and then the smell and him disappeared. It was comforting to be with him one last time. I wish I had more details, but I was only 15 at the time. I followed in his footsteps and currently in the US Army and have been in for almost three years, about to do four, maybe more. Rest in peace, Sergeant Jacques Lemaire, AKA Frock. August 29th, 1926 to July 10th, 2012. This happened to me in third grade and it scared me so much I started crying and had to go to the office to talk to the principal about it. I was in the hallway for misbehaving and my neighbor Tad, a year younger than me, came out of class to my right, passed in front of me and headed down some stairs. We said hi to each other and about 20 seconds later, he walked out of the same class, passed in front of me and headed down the stairs. I just stared at him confused and afraid and he looked back like, why the hell are you looking at me like that? I never realized how much of a matrix deja vu it was. I've also got a second example of this. A few years after this incident, my sister and I were hanging in the living room watching TV. We both saw our mom walk through the other room and through the adjacent hall. 20 minutes later, she came in from the backyard. My sister and I looked at each other confused and asked how she got back outside. She didn't know what we were talking about. She'd been outside for hours. No one else was home, of course. I lived in Southern Ohio and was heading to church with my family when I was about 12 years old. My grandpa slowed down because there was a woman walking on the center line, wearing all white with long, dark hair. He swerved and she reached out and touched the van. Everyone got a crazy feeling. He stopped, looked around, and there was no one there. Can anyone explain that to me, please? In summer vacation, I had to spend time with my grandparents for a while. Mind you, their house is in a remote village surrounded by a pretty dense forest. Overall, it just looks sketchy. I figure it wouldn't be any harm me spending some time there. So I just went there, unpacked my things and started chilling around. First day, no big deal. Second day, all good. Now the third day, different matter. During the day, I had to go get some things from the second floor in order to prepare the food. So I just started going up the stairs. Suddenly I heard some kind of low voice, like a whispering. It sounded completely silent, so I was not able to determine what it was. I just figured it would be the wind, or these kinds of echoes that sound inside our heads sometimes. You get me? I got the things, and down the stairs I went again. Now, that sound got louder. I still couldn't make out what it was, but it sounded every time I went down each stair. So now I was more suspicious. But even then, I just kept minding my own business. 
Night came and it was time to go to my room, which unfortunately enough was also on the second floor. I had completely forgotten about the sound, and the night was calm. So, this time, no wind or placebo effect could influence what I heard. And what I heard each time was when I took a step up the stairs, was an elderly voice saying, one, two, three. It freaked me out, and I sprinted my way up the stairs. And so, with every step I took, the voice followed me and kept counting of them at the same speed I was taking them, like encouraging me to go faster. And during that time, two things happened to me. First of all, I noticed that each sound was coming from each stair, which was creepy to say the least. And the second thing was my brain telling me, Adrian, whatever the hell you do, don't look back. Mind you, I've never agreed with something as much as I agreed with that advice. And I'm pretty sure I broke the record for how many stairs can be climbed in the least amount of time by a human being. Thinking about it now, why the hell did there have to be more than 30 stairs in order to get to the second floor? When I got to my room, I inadvertently started counting my heartbeats, in the same way the voice counted the stairs. I loudly and annoyingly swore out loud, paranoid the voice had come into the room, but there was nothing but complete silence surrounding me. I didn't know what to do. Did I call my grandparents or flee the house before some spirit annihilates me while I sleep? Obviously I slept. I slept like a baby with the amount of mental stress the situation had put me under. And all my energy faded away as I fell asleep in moments. But the next day in the morning, if you'd have told me I was scared of going down a few stairs, I would have laughed. But at that moment, it was a matter of life or death. I literally waited for my grandparents to wake up so that I could go down. And although nothing happened, for the rest of the day I was there, it still has left me quite freaked out. I died. I saw it. I lived it. Either it was on another world with a version of me that died, or I'm going crazy, but I died. We had a prep rally in school and after it was finished, we had to go back to class. When my friend and I we're not in that, so we wanted to go across the street to Sonic. Across the street, there is not heavy traffic, but if you don't pay attention, you can get hit. Well, I remember walking with him and he dropped something. So I went across the street first. I just saw a red Tahu heading right at me and I got hit. I remember everything, gasping for air, waking up and sleeping again, then nothing. All of a sudden, I was back in this stadium again, and the exact same words came out of my principal's mouth. My friend wanted to go get Sonic, but I was freaking out and was asking him everything. I thought it had to just been a dream. But when I went with him to see what would happen, he dropped his stuff again and I waited. To my horror, the same red Tahui shows up, and I told him that I'm going back to school, not dying again. I can still see the other version of me on that street just messed up. Not even moving. My neighbor passed away last week. And since we moved in, we've been friends with him for about 15 years. A few months after he passed away, part of my family visited with their children. Everyone was outside with their kids, when suddenly one of them pointed at the neighbor's property and said, Where did the old man go? He was just there. My cousin, the father of the kids, just said that nobody was there and was a little confused and everyone kind of laughed it off. But I think he was, just looking to check if everything was alright with us. Kind of gave me the creeps a bit, but I hope you rest in peace. At 12 years of age, my mum let me stay in the truck as she went grocery shopping. As I wait, I see an old guy walking towards the truck with an indescribable look at me as if I know too much. He stops five feet from the truck, looks at me for a few seconds and heads back to the exact way he came. It was rather traumatic for some reason and very confusing at that age. Five or six years later, my dad was showing me some home videos of us at Yellowstone. At Old Faithful, I noticed the same guy same look, same clothes, peering at us on camera and at me through the TV. 
I freak out every time I tell this. I work on a dairy, and just the other night I had to clean the milk barn by myself. No one else was on the property. And as I was cleaning, I kept seeing something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a little white face about knee height that was just staring at me. I saw the face near the corners of the barn, and when I turned, there was nothing there, as if what I saw had just ducked around the corner. Then when I went out the gate to open the gate to the coral, I heard someone yell at me, even though everyone was gone. I, a 21 year old man, called home for my dad to come help me finish up and calm down. But my parents were out for the night and no one answered. I finished and went home and had to sit there by myself until they got back. One time, my wife and I were coming back from a dinner night out. When I opened the door of the house, she was sitting at the computer working, as I usually find her when I get home. Nothing unusual, except she was entering the house with me. I shrugged it off and carried on. We went to bed and I told her that I saw her sitting at the computer, and she goes dead serious and told me that when I opened the door, she saw herself sitting at the computer working. Creepiest thing I've ever experienced. The fact that our neighbor's two-year-old daughter used to point to the TV when it was off and tell us the person on the screen was making scary faces and that she wanted it to go away didn't help us sleep much that night. My family decided we would go on an organized ghost hunt at the neighborhood town. It was late at night and there were three sections to this. The first involved using a Ouija board type thing with a glass. Nothing happened. The second involved trying to reach out to spirits in a dark room. Nothing happened. The experiences come from the third section, which was a very old courthouse and we used technology. Firstly, there was digital thermometers set up and one of our family members was sat below one. These thermometers flashed when temperatures spontaneously dropped from room temperature supposedly a sign of a ghost. All of a sudden, this family member jumped up sort of spooked and moved seats while the organizers were explaining this to us and what we were going to do. He proclaimed he suddenly felt extremely cold and tingly. Lo and behold, the thermometer was also flashing and showing very low temperatures just right where he was sitting. That was odd enough, but the second experience was just as odd. I was in a room by myself with my uncle. I had an EMF meter that lit up in the presence of an electromagnetic field. I do know these devices work. However, I don't know how legitimate the specific one I was holding was. I have my own one at home and it does react to real electrical sources such as my PC and the plug sockets. The other device I had was called a spirit box, which was supposed to detect words ghosts were trying to say to reach out to them. This device didn't convince me at all, and I'm still not fully convinced by it, but certainly more curious about it. I was asking questions, and the EMF meter was flashing in accordance to these questions. It seemed to work, but there was no telling whether it was legitimate or not. However, I wanted to push the boundaries of yes and no questions to see how realistic it all was. If a ghost was real, surely it can answer any binary questions as long as I give it two options and the corresponding amount of flashes on the EMF meter for an answer, not just yes or no. So I did. I asked out loud, are you a man or woman? Flash once for man, twice for woman. At the time, I wasn't convinced this would work and I was skeptical. However, the EMF flashed twice and within five seconds of that, the spirit box displayed and read out loud the word female. Two completely independent devices simultaneously confirmed the answer I supposedly got. That was a big deal for me. And still to this day, I cannot figure out an explanation for that. And the two devices remained consistent for that entire session. I hope for the existence or something beyond life. And this for me was a glimpse at some actual proof.
My girlfriend is a manager where she works, and since the pandemic has affected everything, she's been working from home. She can't afford to be away from her computer for any length of time, so I pick up the slack by working around the house and running errands. Errands were the order of the day, and I needed to go to our big local big box wholesale store to pick up some things, then the hardware store, and finally the supermarket for some dinner items. The trip to the wholesale store took longer than expected due to roadway construction, and I was very frustrated and angry by the time I made it to the street and was en route to my final stop. Traffic from that point on was moderate, but I was still annoyed from the earlier mess and drove more aggressively than I should have. Finally, I made it to the supermarket where I collected the needed items. But when I tried to go through one of the cell checkout stations, the damn thing kept messing up and my earlier frustration was redoubled, as it was all I could do to not scream profanities at the thing. But I managed to get my items and get back out to my vehicle. I sat there for a moment, letting the air conditioning cool me off as it had been quite warm outside. I was still aggravated and frustrated by the entire experience. So, I tried to calm down and scrolled through my phone to get my mind focused. As I stared casually at the screen out of my left peripheral vision, I saw a woman walk towards the store entrance. She was wearing a light three-quarter sleeve shirt, greyish coloured shorts and a black piping. Her hair was pulled up in a bun on the back of her head and she wore large brown sunglasses, which she was adjusting with her right hand. I watched her for a moment as she headed into the store. Now I don't know if my earlier heightened emotional state had anything to do with this, but not more than one minute later the exact same woman walked past me in front of me again. Now let me be clear, this wasn't another person who looked like this woman, not a twin, nor had the woman returned to her vehicle without me seeing her. This was not deja vu. This was the same woman, same clothes, same hair and sunglasses that she adjusted with her right hand in exactly the same manner as before. My jaw hung slack as I witnessed this. I couldn't make sense of it. I have never had anything like this happen to me. I was totally freaked out. I thought about going back to the store to try and confirm what I'd seen, but I knew that I was not seeing things and that this actually happened. Ultimately, I elected to just go home. Sometimes I wonder if the Matrix really exists. My husband, my daughter and I moved into our colonial style farmhouse last October. It was built in 1900, has five wooded acres that are about miles of conservation. And we have two neighbors far apart, both older retired people who would drive to our house if they needed to see us, which one has done and they seem nice. When we moved into the house, my daughter started talking about an uncle fungo and wouldn't elaborate on it except to say Uncle Fungo is here. She was two and a half, so I figured it was from her show she watches, and still might be. He was mainly mentioned while playing with toys in the bath. It was fine until she said while playing, girls are trash. I was horrified since she's not around anyone that would say anything like that. Plus, all the shows she watches are her screen age appropriate. So, where did she hear that? I ask her, and she says that Uncle Fungo said it. Anyway, I dropped the subject being weirded out, but fortunately she never spoke about it anymore. It was a very odd thing, and she'd never made up people before. We've also had incredibly bad luck while living here, but we love the place anyway, and I don't feel like there's anything necessarily bad or evil within the house. While exploring our woods, I found a wreck of a very old car in the woods that must have crashed down the hill and been left there. The trees grew around it and it looked rather somber. Must have been a bad crash too, since it's in a bad shape. Kind of eerie and unsettling. Not sure if that means the place is haunted or not. It's just the knocking that bothers me. Last January, my daughters were playing in the living room and she can see the office from there. She yells to me while I'm in the kitchen that she sees something in the office and she's upset. I turn the light on in there since it's usually dark in that room and there's nothing. I walk back to the kitchen and hear a very loud knock 
at what sounds like the front door. My daughter yells, visitors, and we both go to the back door to find no one there. No cars around, and a passerby prankster knocker is highly unlikely due to our location. It freaked me out so much I called my husband. He said it was probably a woodpecker. It sounded nothing like a woodpecker, but I let it go. Months have passed, and it's been a hard year overall, not really having my mind on odd happenings. Now, just yesterday, my daughter and I are getting ready for her dance class, and we hear a more normal knock. We both hear it and assume it's our neighbor who drives over sometimes. Unfortunately, it wasn't, and I'm freaked out. It's the knocking again. We've heard plenty of other sounds in the house, but that one is so specific. Ever since I was a kid, I have what I call doubling. Occasionally happen around me. I put something in my pocket and then find it in another pocket, as well as in the original pocket I had it in. And yes, it's happened with money before. The most standout example was when I was a teen at camp. All the leaders had engraved plastic name tags and we were all issued only one. I used to keep mine between my hat and my shirt. At the end of camp, I just crammed all my stuff in a duffel and headed home. Later, when I unpacked, the first thing I do is pull out my hat with my tag in it. And of course, a minute later, I pull out a shirt with the same name tag pinned to it. I also have experienced a similar phenomenon where I was a kid. For a few years, it happened on a daily basis, but I haven't seen it much in a long time. Someone would place something in their pocket or backpack, but when they went to grab it, it would later be missing. I would then reach into my pocket or backpack and pull it out. I initially got accused of being a thief, but when it happened repeatedly, when I hadn't even been within 20 feet of the victim, my friends and classmates stopped doing it. So they just kind of accepted that it would happen around me. Moral of the story, I'm a quantum counterfeit and pickpocket. My house is haunted by many different spirits from kids to adults not to mention I've named them all. A small girl called Mizu, a cat called Muffin, and a tall ghost man called Mr. No, a lady in the garage called Isabel, and a four-legged creature called Sal, and a group of three ghosts that like to say goodbye that I've named the Three Musketeers. They're usually quite friendly but can become hostile. There is one story about Sal that I would like to share. I lost my Apple TV cord about a week or two ago. I was on the verge of a panic attack because I knew my mother would beat the paranormal out of me if I didn't find it. So I was freaking out something hard in the kitchen when something caught my eye. It looked humanish but was on all fours and moving rather oddly. I blinked for a split second and saw it running towards my bedroom. I quickly run into my door and slam it shut put my back on the door and try to keep it from coming in. At that moment, I was also texting my friend about it when all of a sudden it starts pushing on the door over and over as if trying to get in. I start crying as I was scared and after a while I hear it leave, get up and turn off my lights. I start to fall asleep when three different voices whisper, good night from my closet. I ended up falling asleep after that. 